Good evening to everyone at home. My name is Lucy Mukherjee and welcome to tonight's Pride themed conversation about the documentary Terence McNally, Every Act of Life. In a theatrical career spanning six decades, Terence McNally produced three dozen plays, wrote books for 10 musicals, four operas and won five Tony Awards. In March of this year, Terence passed away from coronavirus complications related to a lung condition. Terence made it his life's work to humanize the gay community by centering his plays squarely on the lives and loves of gay men using humor and pathos to break down discrimination. Tonight, I'm excited to speak to four of Ter Terence's friends and collaborators. Um, in a little while, Andre De Shields will be joining us and then there will be time for audience questions. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce our first three guests. Jeff Kaufman is an award-winning documentarian and the writer, director, and producer of Every Act of Life. And two prolific performers, both Tony Award-winning and Emmy-nominated actors who starred in Terence McNally's Love, Valor, and Compassion, John Benjamin Hickey and John Glover. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi, Lucy. Hello. Hi. Very happy to be here. Me too, me too. So Jeff, I think we'll start with you. Every Act of Life premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2018 and went on to play at so many festivals around the country. Can you share some highlights of you and Terence presenting the film in front of an audience? Well, first of all, it wasn't me and Terence. You know, it was a group and Terence. Uh, it, this film wouldn't exist without producer Marsha Ross, uh, our wonderful editor, you know, our camera people, and uh, the, the, the composer. You know, it's it's a team like like in the theater. So um, it was always a shared event, and oftentimes uh, Terrence's wonderful husband and uh, a fabulous producer Tom Crittenden, he was with us as well. Uh, and you know, that was an amazing thing to experience. First of all, celebrating Terence's life, sometimes exploring parts of Terence's life that he may have um, not known as much about himself or avoided or had to think about again, uh, both with Terence and, and with Tom. So it all started with those two. And then to, you know, like uh, being at the Castro Theater in San Francisco uh, and having 2000 people, the entire place uh, stand on his feet and applaud Terence for like five minutes and Terence just, taking it in. Um, there can't be any more satisfying experience in a film than that. That's wonderful. Um, both of the Johns, I'd love to hear when you first saw the film. Um, it was a screening in New York. Um, it started in a little, there was a little party in a very crowded store. And then we all went to this place on 23rd Street. Uh, it used to be a movie theater and then changed back to a movie theater and saw the movie there. And it was beautiful, just beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Jeff and Marsha, I think, sent it to me because I wasn't able to be at that thing or um, whatever. I, I, I saw it by myself in my apartment and uh, I just was knocked out by it because I'd been a small part of it and I'd been a part of Terrence's life, a small part, and, and just the stuff that I didn't know the stuff I learned um, about Amazing, his, right? his early years, you know, and also like Terrence was always, this wasn't my only takeaway, but Terrence was always a great looking man. He was so hot. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was so stunningly handsome and, and yeah. that I was like, holy crap, look at Terrence. So the whole thing was such a, a wonderful education in a person who I already thought I knew. Um, I think Terence is known for writing work that makes audiences want to live more fully and more truthfully to be themselves. Um, and in the film, he expresses that we go to the theater to see actors strip themselves of their characters and show us their hearts. So uh, can each of you tell us how you and he work together and how his writing and his characters allowed you to be vulnerable on stage? I, I, I'm hesitant to say it, but it's the truth. I'd never seen one of Terence's plays and I was living in LA at the time and they were gonna do, it's only a play at the, uh, at the Amundsen. 
uh, but the, anyway, but so they had a reading of it and I couldn't do it because I was gonna do another play, but I got a postcard from him that said, it's, I'm sorry, you can't do it. But, and, and he had his phone number at the bottom. So then I went to see in New York when I was visiting uh, Lips Together, Teeth Apart and it just blew me away. And I raced home hoping I could still find that postcard. And I called him up and asked him if when they do the play at the taper, could I play the role of John? And he let me do it. I mean, so that's how I found him. Um, and I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've done like seven Thank plays, a Terrence's play since? Yeah, Five, yeah, seven. yeah, yeah. Wow, seven? Yeah. Oh my God. Well, mm -hmm. I did the Lips Together, Teeth Apart, and then there was Some Men that we did a workshop of and then a production in Philadelphia. And then he called me about doing Lisbon Triviata, Traviata, at which I didn't call him back for two weeks because I was terrified. I mean, it's what, what, what made Nathan, Nathan. I mean, that, that was wow. He, and I knew nothing about opera or, the, or anything. And I just, uh, he called, I called furious one day. He said, two weeks, you, you waited. You still haven't called me back. What, what's going on? I called you at home. You mother, mother. So, so I just told him why I was afraid. And, and, and he just said, well, it's the things you're supposed to do that you're afraid of, right? So, so I just committed right there and had the time of my life. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. My fear was, uh was sort of, I, I, in some ways, more personal based at the time because uh, I was just starting out. I had not, I'd only done maybe a, one or two plays in New York and, uh, and I was acquainted with Joe Mantello who uh, suddenly had gotten this opportunity to direct his first Broadway play, <laughs> Our Compassion, which is another incredible testament to Terrence that I think there were a lot of very much heavier weights who were vying to direct that play. And Joe came in, met with Terrence and had uh, like a very kind of unified vision of how to do it. Right. He never directed a Broadway play and convinced Terrence to go to Lynn Meadow and say, I, it was off Broadway at this time, but, and, and, and Terrence told Lynn, I want this guy to do it. And Joe said to me, um, come in and read for this play. And it was at a time in my life when I would, I'm ashamed to admit now, where you were like trying to uh, be very selective about your gay parts. <laughs> because, you know, I'd done one last year and even your agents would say to you, this is at a time where like, be careful, be careful. Um, and then you read this play and, yeah. and not, only, not only was it like the best gay parts ever, every single person in the play was completely different from the next, including Glover playing two completely different people who happen to be twin brothers. And, and it was like, how do you, he, he, he opened, you, you talked about humanity and he wrote about you know, that kind of humanity in his plays was sort of, it opened the door for me to not be afraid of you know, parsing or being like trying to decide what best way to navigate myself as a an actor, a gay man in this business. Because if you got to be in a Terrence McNally play, you know, it was just a great good fortune. I'll say. Thank you. Big time. Jeff, can you take us uh, behind the scenes of the shooting of some of the interviews in the film? You've got an incredible cast of Broadway legends, including Rita Moreno, Audra McDonald, Nathan Lane, Edie Falco, among many others. Was there one that was particularly memorable or emotional to shoot? Well, I should say these two guys, because <laughs> <laughs> they're here. Um, but honestly, it's really, it was, an incredible experience because these are just like the legends of Broadway and uh, and rightly so because of immense talent and accomplishments uh, and you know people have the right to be arrogant and unpleasant if they want to at that level but over and over and over again in part because of the Terrence connection but also in part I think because of the people Terrence is drawn to uh, uh, everyone we spoke to was incredibly forthcoming um, 
and eager to share something unusual about themselves. And I, I don't want to pick out anyone individually, but uh, it's a humbling experience to be, you know, inches away from someone uh, and to be able to ask them highly intimate questions and and for love of theater and love of the process and love of Terrence, have, have them share that with you. Um, and, but again, I just have to say, um, you know, Terrence is someone who um, could be immensely loyal to people and he brings out that loyalty from others. And this can be complicated, but um, uh, I think that served us wonderfully. <laughs> In the film, Terence talks about um, theatre people, um, all theatre people, um, building surrogate families. Are you cognizant of doing that, um, of collecting your favourite people and making them your tribe, your surrogate family? Sure. Well, hopefully. You come away with uh, some new friends, some new people that you didn't know before, that you've seen their work and you got to work with them. Yeah, and he always uh, was at the in the rehearsal hall, just kind of typing away at his typewriter, listening, listening, listening. When we did Fire and Air, John Doyle said, "You need to go away for about four days." <laughs> yeah. And the day that Terrence came back, I saw him at the elevator. I said, oh, "Terrence, we've missed you so much." He was like a little boy who just come home. He was mm -hmm. he was he didn't understand why they, why John sent him away. It was beautiful, just beautiful. He was a beautiful man. Yeah. Yeah. He had such generosity too. Yep. Yep. For somebody who could write such, you know, caustic, biting humor, um, he had, he was, he was completely genuine in his uh, love of his fellow um, writers, his fellow um, theater people. I just finished doing this play this past year, The Inheritance. Matthew Lopez and Matthew was that play when I read it I was like oh this guy learned everything he learned from Terrence McNally and Matthew has said that and Terrence because Tom Curtis Terrence's husband produced it Terrence was around a lot and his love and affection and generosity of spirit with that young writer and that company was like oh that was it was amazing for me 25 years later to see Terrence kind of not passing a baton, it wasn't as grand as that, but like, wow, well, look at that. He really does uh, practice what he preaches. He, he really does, he, he embodied that kind of generosity that's very hard to find in the theater because the theater can be a very mean, <laughs> green, dingy place. And parents could write that, but he didn't have that. He wasn't that kind of person. Can I mention one quick thing um, based on that, which is that, you know, talk about passing the baton and the theater is always discovering new talent and, and, and bringing new people in. Um, and one of the things that was remarkable about Terrence was that at every stage of his life, he was always seeing every single play he could see. He might have to walk up four flights to some podunk mini theater to see some new playwright or some actor he'd heard about, but he was relentlessly curious always. And I think that if you're planning any kind of career, that's the spirit you want is what's new? What can I learn? How can I stay on top of my game? And that was really Terrence. The only way you last, right, John, is to have curiosity. I mean, you, as soon as you stop being curious. Yeah, you're yeah. dead. <laughs> yeah, keep it alive. Yeah. We're going to come back to John Glover and John Benjamin Hickey in a few moments, but right now we're going to go to our beloved actor, director, choreographer, and educator, Andre De Shields. We know he's there. There we go. Hello, Andre. Yes, hello, hello, hello. Thank you for Thank the you lovely for introduction. Absolutely. I think this is the first time I'm meeting an Emmy, Grammy, and Tony Award winner. Oh, there's, <laughs> there's, there's more to come. <laughs> yeah. I, have to do, I have to do the big O to be, become an EGOT. Yes, yeah, so we're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> we're ready. Yeah. I was really moved in the film by... Um, the inclusion of the letter from Terence's high school English teacher, 
uh, many decades later, her, her words of encouragement still meant so much to him. And, and I think even more than any award that he won um, because he was so critical of his own work. I wondered if you had any insight into that, given that you're also a prolific artist and a very creative person. Um, do you think Terence was able to take pride in his work? I believe so. I believe Terence McNally took pride in his work. That is not to say that the pride was ego driven. That is not to say that it was overbearing hubris, but it is the joy that one takes knowing that he can go into his toolbox, take out the appropriate tool and achieve the task that he set before himself. It's hard enough to achieve tasks that other people bring to you. But one is always, one always demands more of himself than anyone else could possibly. And it's not about perfection. It's about authenticity. And in the world at large, but specifically in the world of art, and I include playwrights under the category of performing artists because it takes every element. It takes your emotion, it takes your intellect, it takes your heart, it takes your passion, it takes your ability to eat rejection when it comes your way. It takes your ability to make um, a, a, a friend of, of insecurity when it comes your way. And that's all about being able to perform the task that's set before you. I come to it from that, maybe it sounds a little oblique, but I come to it from that angle because I've only had two experiences, mano a mano, with Terence McNally. The first was in the full Monty. We did the pre-Broadway tryout at the Old Globe in San Diego. And he came to me one day not because we had planned a meeting, but he just approached me and he says, I want you to know how much I respect your talent. You are so brave. And I thought, I like what I've just heard, but I wonder what he has seen about me to use those words. I countered with when I consider it retrospectively, it must have seemed like a challenge to him, but I didn't intend it that way. I was simply hungry for someone who would accept me as his muse. So I said to him, if you think I'm so brave, as you are creating this character, Allow me to inform it. The difference being, of course, you're going to come to me with pages of script. But when you do, I want to be able to recognize me in the man that I'm supposed to share my DNA with. So many times in the theater, and you get the opportunity to create a character, the most difficult part is moving aside that which is not pertinent to what you want to bring to the building of the interior architecture. And as we continued that process, by the time we got to New York with the opening in 2000, I saw Andre de Shields in the character of Horse which is why I was able to perform it so well, which is why it brought to me my second Tony nomination. Shall I continue or do you want to ask another question? I 
do have one question, and I think it's related to what you're talking about. Terence, obviously, we hear in the film he's a stickler for punctuation, and he had this expectation of actors to read his words exactly as he wrote them, without any ad libs or pauses where there shouldn't be. Um, how, since he wrote this character for you, did you have that experience with him? Was it intimidating? No, it was not intimidating. It was as if I was engaging my brother because I was able to serve the work that uh, Terence had written in my own meticulous fashion as he served my character in his own meticulous fashion. I'm a man of language. The first thing I did when I was growing up in Baltimore, Maryland, when as a young colored boy, this is the late 50s, the early 60s, it's before Black was beautiful and that sort of thing. We were either Negro or colored. And I was considering how I was going to ameliorate my life. I came up in an impoverished situation. And what came to me was, what I need to do is to master the language better than my oppressor so that I could always understood, understand what's being said to me and whatever I said would always be understood. So there was a lovely match between Terence and myself because we both were concerned about the efficacy of language and choosing the right word and uh, making sacrosanct that a subject had to agree with his verb, et cetera. Because then my ambition in the theater is to levitate the audience, levitate myself first and then levitate the audience. And when you, and when you are meticulous about your work, it comes across so clear that the audience has to dispense with any distraction except for agreeing to be raised up, levitated. Terrence and I didn't have an intimate relationship, but because you spent so much time together, it was always cordial. And I came to him one day because the character in The Full Monty is not an elitist. He's an ordinary black guy. He blue collar worker. He struggles all his life. He's perceived as a septuagenarian he never did anything special. No one ever knew that he had a gift of dance. And when uh, the premise of the play was to look for the ordinary guy who could dance, when he comes into the context of the play, you think, oh, what, what is this guy going to do? And in that context, I said to Terrence, you know, if, if this man were plucked out of reality, when he said the word A-S-K, he wouldn't say ask, he would say X, right? He wouldn't say hypnotize, he would say hypnotize. He wouldn't say statistics, he would say statistics. And of course, Terence retorted, is that the man you want to create for your audience to see? I said, let me think about that. And I thought, no, they see enough of that. All they have to do is turn on the television and that's the stereotype that they're going to tattoo me with. 
if they were to run into me on the street. Oh, there's that guy. I better cross the street because this means trouble. So I said, Terrence, you're right. Let's lift this guy higher. It sounds like the two of you were a great team. We were a great team, um, intermittently. He had much more to do in the writing of the play than to uh, babysit me. But once he gave me the information, once he gave me the tool, I went to work. He says in the film that an artist responds to their world and tries to make sense of it. And I can't help but wonder what he would write, what he would be writing right now. Um, he expressed anger at the artists who did nothing while the city burned. That's another quote from the film. Thinking about the uprisings that are going on around the world in support of black lives. I want to ask both of you, how is life right now informing your craft and fueling your passion for telling stories that bring people together? Perhaps Let, Jeff, start, Andre, forgive me for just starting for a second and then I'll pass it to you. Uh, only because I, I watched one of Terrence's last interviews several times, um, just a few months before he died. And he was asked by an audience member, what is the next play you'd like to write? And we'd all heard him describe various plays that he might want to do. But literally in his last interview that I think was done, he said, I'd like to write about racism. He says, I think it's like the defining issue of our time and it's so, so scary. And that's what I'd like to write about. And so yes. that's Terrence, you know, um, just months ago. Yes, yes, indeed. That's his ear to the ground. And yeah. to people's hearts and people's needs. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the, the, the concept of the ear to the ground, which we uh, borrow from the indigenous population that was here when Cristobal Colombo came over, yeah. is that you can hear before you see. So the information is coming you from organic and natural sources. And what it does is infects the imagination because without the imagination, nothing is going to be manifest. So let me, let me tell a, a different story that will bring, bring us back to this question. I came to New York in 1973 um, before Broadway was really embracing these doctrines of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I come from Chicago where my first production was Hair in 1969, which although we didn't use these specific words, was diverse, it was equitable, was inclusive. That's what hair was about. I come to New York, which is this, you know, the greatest city in the world, which means it's the center of the universe. And if that's true, then Broadway is the epicenter of the universe. But I found it to be terribly provincial because it was homogenous. It did not reflect the world that was going on on the street. And I, I wondered, why hasn't Terrence McNally written a play for me, not for Andre De Shields per se, but a play that would reflect the man that I am? Why hasn't Edward Albee written a play that would reflect the man I am? Why hasn't Peter Stone written a play that would reflect the man I am? Why hasn't Tom Stoppard? As if they don't know who I am, as if I don't exist in their world. Because the, the, um, uh, the insight is a playwright writes what he knows. So I'm interpreting, I'm interpreting that to mean these playwrights don't know me. 
We live in the same world. We travel the same streets. We have mutual colleagues, but somehow they don't know me. I know now, and I had um, inklings of it then, partly why that was the case. Because although they all knew men of color, they didn't know a man of color who was erudite. So fast forward. Uh, to do my due diligence, I served on the council at Actors' Equity Association. Because if you volunteer, then you can really do your best work for the rank and file. I say that because I became the chair of the Committee on Racial Equality. Because in the early 90s, there was some very funky stuff happening on Broadway. Uh, having to do with Miss Saigon, having to do with, um, uh, what is the piece that Tommy Toon directed with an all-female cast? All right, but it's some, it, 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 those two pieces. Now, we had an organization that was made of participants from the League of Theater Owners and Producers, playwrights, and members of the acting tribe. I sat on this committee as the chair of the Committee of Racial Equality and representing the playwrights was Peter Stone. And I had seen the revival of 1776. And I thought, okay, here we are. Maybe we can start resolving the problem now. And in one of the meetings, I asked Peter Stone um, why is it that I'm not represented in any of the plays that you've done, particularly 1776, since it talks about the founding of this country? We had a long conversation. The conversation ended when Peter Stone said, I don't know how to write Black. And I thought, that isn't what I'm asking. I don't know how to talk black. So when I finally had an opportunity to do something that required erudition, it wasn't until last year, 2019, playing the character of Hermes. And I'm positive Andre, I think you, your video He's not played. playing the stereotype. Yeah. He would have gladly played when I had those conversations with Terrence McNally, but he reminded me of my own gift. You want to levitate. So it wasn't until I began working with Rachel Chafkin and Anais Mitchell that I knew that particular gift that I owned was going to be put to use. I thanked Terrence at that moment because he was one of the, he, he held up a cautionary finger about settling for the stereotype and going for the archetype, which is what Hermes is. I tell that story to say the next time I worked with Terrence was in the Pride Plays of 2018. And he gave me a beautiful gift, some men. And I read it and I thought, what am I going to do with this? And then I realized there were two archetypes in the play 
that if I could combine them, I could really do something important with this after only having had one afternoon of rehearsing. But the two archetypes that, was, that were there, which he didn't explain to me, and which wasn't in any of the annotations, but the character I had to play, I thought, oh, this is half James Baldwin, the prophet, the meticulous prophet, and this is half Bobby Short, the meticulous bon vivant. And I put them together and Jeff said to me in a conversation in preparation for this, that he thought it was exceptional. Um, and I appreciate it. I was, I was in that reading. Because yeah. exactly John was there. I was and in that. I had reading. done something. Did. Let, let me just, I was let me satisfied just point out. Andre, A, that, that you were amazing. McNally was well, satisfied with. And we're having a little the audience there. was satisfied with. Yeah. And that just, was just full of information way. that I could carry into the future, knowing that it would be informative for whatever else I would do. I've talked too much, I know. No, 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 you haven't. I just wanted to point out that John Glover was in the original production of that play, Some Men, and John Hickey, uh, John Benjamin Hickey, shared the stage with you for that Pride uh, uh, performance. Um, and What's so that? you all share that experience through Terrence together. It's amazing. As we move into this last segment, um, we're just waiting for some audience questions. Jeff, I wonder if, if you want to pose a question to the group. Um, no pressure there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, Terrence was always trying to find, um, I think it was John Glover who actually said Terrence didn't have any villains in his plays, any bad guys in his plays. He was always trying to find the truth in people. And so I wondered if being in, in embodying one of Terrence's characters then taught what you a truth. What should I know here? I just talk and about. talk and talk. If playing one of Terrence's characters, did that teach you something that you could then take off stage into your own life? I know that when I played those twins, that, that, that one of the twins people used to say was the bad twin. But I always said in my heart, no, he's the frightened twin who oh. wants people to love him more than anything. And it's what makes him so uptight and come off like that way. So it, it was it was his vulnerability that uh, that that made him behave that way, and when I when I realized that it, it just unlocked a, a lot, and and for me too because I I suffer from this a great deal, <laughs> wanting to be loved, but then who doesn't so, to some extent? <laughs> You're succeeding here, John. What? <laughs> Thank you. Succeeding in that quest here. Andre, hon, I didn't know you were from Baltimore. I grew up in Salisbury, Maryland, and I went to Towson State Teachers College. <laughs> hon, are you there? I, know, I think we had a technical issue. John, Hick, John Benjamin Hickey, do you, do you have a sense of, for yourself, since Lucy asked me to ask you? I'm sorry, what did Lucy want me to ask? What you wanted to ask you what? Remind, remind me. Just if, did you learn something from playing one of Terrence's characters that you applied to your own life? Uh, I loved, I have a line, I had a line, I don't remember anything I've ever done, but I remember a line from Love Valor, you know, 25, 30 years ago, where my character goes, oh, I, I, I shouldn't be gay. I, I hate opera. I can throw a ball. I love both my parents. <laughs> he was so, um, he found, like, I played the, I remember somebody, a couple of people said to me like, oh, you kind of have the thankless part. You kind of have the, you know, the part who's like the real straight guy. I, I thought it was the best part in the play. I think <laughs> I, that. I mean, Glover really had the best part in the play and Nathan, but that was the thing. I don't know if I'm answering the question, but it's like, you, you read that play and you're like, my part is the best part. It's the best part. Well, because you believed in it. Yeah, they were yeah. so fully realized and, given so much love and humanity, and that's a perfect way to describe 
the who was the bad bad one james was the frightened one like he wasn't a bad guy he was just really 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 scared john john was yeah. john was the john was the yeah, yeah. um we yeah. have a question from the audience um for mr glover mr hickey and mr de shields <clears throat> could you talk about a time when you had difficulty with a play and explain your experience and how you pushed through it which one? <laughs> <laughs> Be the most recent. <laughs> but one of the most interesting stories for me when I saw the documentary was about Lips Together, Teeth Apart. Because I had no idea that those actors went to him and said, we, this, this is ugly. Or, and, and that he listened to them all and went back home and made it the play that I saw that I fell in love with with all those people's vulnerability. I just lost a lover of six years. And so I, all very sensitive for me. And it was just so important for me to be in that play at that time. And he gave me that chance, but I had no idea before I saw this documentary about what the play evolved from, from Terrence listening to an actor. And I loved Andre's you know, stories about he and Terrence. Oh, it's amazing, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Are we getting Andre back? He's he's working through some technical difficulties right now, but I see, I think he's coming back right now. I hope everybody got um, to hear that, that it's his extraordinary, yeah. Yeah, that, that description of him and Terrence talking about who that man was going to be and for, is so, so Terrence. And also there's that great story, Glover, from Love Valor, when there was a, sort of a, a, a lull, as if, it, if that's the right word, in the third act. And he and Nathan had a conversation as to what that- what oh, That speech he wrote? The speech, yeah. and, the, yeah, yeah. and that, it, that I, I don't know if Nathan said that, the, you know, we need an 11 o'clock number here. He, he probably didn't say I, that. I remember what he said. He said yeah. something like, yeah, he's funny, right? Mm -hmm. But isn't there more? And I think that was what seeded it. I don't, because it, he did come back with an 11 o'clock number. The next that day, day in rehearsal was unforgettable. It was good, the most unforgettable thing any of us had ever seen. Yeah, like yeah. Nathan reads this speech that he didn't change a word of. It just was, that was what he ended up performing yeah. where he talks about why can't musicals reflect life more and right, right. have terror. Oh my God, it was devastating. 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 So we have one more question. Um, I'd love to pose this to all of you. Uh, what advice would you give to a performer about how to interpret one of Terence's works? Um, recognize the humor and the humanity <laughs> and, um, and just go for honesty. Yeah. That's well perfect. Said. Recognizing the humor. Terence believed in circling the jokes. I mean, oh. Great, sure. That, well, that's, that's what makes an audience, little, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, to laugh is the best thing. I remember somebody that when we when we first started previews, they were buying tickets in the lobby during the first act, and he said he'd never heard so much laughter coming out of a theater <laughs> as as he did at uh, at the play. You just hear roars of laughter again and uh, again and again and I, again. I think Terrence knew that there was like a paper's edge between comedy and tragedy that, and that you feel the pain so much more if you felt the humanity and the humor right before. Exactly, yeah. Thank you. I want, to I want to remind everybody at home that Every Act of Life is playing on PBS Thanks. right now as part of the American Masters series. I hope you'll all tune in to watch it and be sure to visit the no. film website, Every I Act can, of Life. I can, I can only see myself. Can I just say, we're sorry we lost Andre at the end. And yeah. John and John and Lucy and everybody who joined us today. I, try, I, I tried it. You mean you want me to go back to the, the log on? Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories in tribute to Terrence and the impact he's had on you. Um, Jeff, if you would like to share any parting words with the audience at home before we go, I'm turning over to you. All right, well, I would just say that as in the careers of these three gentlemen, uh, there is so much to explore in Terence's work. And 
you can see or read something 20 years ago and read it now and get something completely new. So just uh, see a play, read a play, experience uh, the work, and um, it'll get inside you. And Terrence will keep living through that. And thank you. God thank bless. You. Happy Pride, everybody. Yep. Right. Thanks, Lucy Jane Mukherjee. Mm. <laughs> You're divine. Thanks, How are you, Hickey? So are you, Jeff. And Andre, I love you. Thank <laughs> you.